I'm not somebody who will ever cut and paste a love scene. They're always, it's a different couple. And so they react differently to each other and to whatever situation is going on. And I don't, I don't get embarrassed. I don't get, you know, it's, it's just part of life. And I put that in and part of the reason for that, and I know this is going to sound crazy, but so many girls that had had these terrible things happen to them would be very promiscuous, but they never felt anything. And I would say it's because you don't have a good partner. You're not in love with your partner. He's not doing anything for you. So I wanted them to know what good sex was. And writers should realize that the words they put down touch people. And you don't know who they're, you're going to touch and you don't know uh, what you say is going to do, what it's going to do to somebody. That was the voice of Christine Fian, paranormal author extraordinaire, author of over 100 books, and uh, just a superstar of the genre and has been for decades. Her first book, Dark Prince, came out in 1999, right at the very beginning of the paranormal boom that we talk about. Uh, so we talk to Christine about her life, how she came to romance, um, how she came to writing paranormals, and how she continues to write in this sh- subgenre that you know we all we all love and and wish there was more of. Welcome to Faded Mates, everyone. I'm Jennifer Prokop, a romance reader and editor. And I'm Sarah McLean. I read romance novels and I write them. And without further ado, here's our conversation with Christine Fian. Perfect. So um, thank you so much, Christine, for joining us. We're very excited, um, in large part because it feels like you really came to romance in an interesting time and place and way. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you found romance as a reader and then again as a writer, or was it simultaneous? Actually, it wasn't simultaneous at all. I uh, started reading when I was very, very young, at a very young age, and started writing when I was very young. uh, The minute I could put sentences together, I started making up stories, and I would write them down the minute I could, you know, when I could put sentences together. And I think the first time I ever read a romance, I found these old, old books by Gene Stratton Porter, The Harvester and Freckles and, you know, those. And I realized, you know, there was kind of this romance thing going (laughs) and I found it you know, really intriguing. I was probably 10 or even younger. I read books way over my head. Us too. (laughs) One of us. um, You know, then I started looking for anything I could read uh, that might have um, some sort of a connection between a girl and a guy because I wanted a happy happy ending or a happy anything involved in it and so that sort of started me down that that path of looking for you know something happy in the book all the time so that that was sort of my intro to uh to romance and I found Louisa May Alcott of course Mm -hmm. read everything that she wrote and I would read that to my grandmother um, when she, whenever she was ill, I would sit and read to her. And, and then later, uh, different ones that kind of inspired me for different reasons. Uh, actually, the Born Identity, um, I, I liked the fact that they worked together. Uh, they, they were equal partners. Um, people, I think, mostly saw the movie. They didn't really read that book the way it should have been read. But without her, he wouldn't have made it. He, she really was his equal partner in that book. 
And I loved that. I really uh, read that a couple of times to to see how he made that happen. And I really liked that. That was one of them. That doesn't surprise me at all that that the born identity is a text for you. I mean, it makes perfect sense now <laughs> as yeah. a fan reader. So yeah. And then one that really made an impact on me, probably that opened up the whole paranormal world for me, uh, and I read it very early on, was uh, Gift of Fire and Gift of Gold by Jane N. Krentz. And I I forget how old I was when I read that, um, but all of a sudden it was like it opened this whole world to me. And I thought, this is really what I I want to write. Plus, I realized that my hero could be flawed and my um, villain could. I really liked that the villain was rounded out so much. And so I started studying villains to, you know, figure them out like how did they write these villains and how did they become you liked them and you didn't like, you know, I mean, there were good things about them as well as bad things. How did they get to be who they were? So I think they all had such an impact on me. Um, One of the biggest uh, impacts on me for all of my writing was Sherlock Holmes. I read Sherlock Holmes so many times that I literally could quote pages of Sherlock Holmes, of his work. And then another writer uh, was Laurie R. King, uh, The Beekeeper's Apprentice. I thought that was such a fabulous take on what she did. You would never expect her to put that heroine with him and and how she managed to make that work that was an interesting uh line you know a pairing for me so at what point during this kind of reading you're obviously you weren't you've been an avid reader forever did you start thinking i think i can maybe do this you know i never did i (laughs) always wrote i always wrote i had hundreds of manuscripts under my bed like i'd write them and throw them write them in their own. Like I just wrote all the time. It was sort of a compulsion for me. Mm-hmm. I could not not write. I had to write. I had so many stories in my head. I did not think about publishing them. You know, people, m- other people had movie stars and rock stars that they would scream and yell and, oh my God, they're so <laughs> wonderful. No, for me, it was writers. And so I never looked at myself and thought I could ever be a writer like they could be because I kind of worshipped those writers. They were amazing. My first job was in a library and I would just read every book that I could in that library. Living the dream. Well, it's the other thing that's interesting, though, about like that kind of list of books you named is I think one of the hallmarks of your style is an interest in like the paranormal, but not necessarily, even though you're, you know, the, the the Carpathian series is very much about like vampires, but about like Jane Ann Krentz, actually, right? Like telepathy and what the brain is capable of. So has that also always been interesting to you? Absolutely. I, I research so much. And my belief really is even with vampires, if you look at every society all over the world, you look at at what their beliefs are. You're, you know, going back hundreds of years, and all of them have something like that in their background. And where does it come from? You have to start thinking if every culture has something like that in it, where does it come from? And if every country pretty much has done these experiments with telepathy and with all these other things, why are they doing them? And after a while, you start getting these answers. You start hitting on things that, oh, this did work for for somebody. This did work here. This did work there. And after so much research, 
you're you're kind of catching up with the future things that they're already doing. Like my my Ghost Walker series, I I have a hard time ke- keeping ahead of the game, and I research very hard to do that. But and I and I always have primary sources, but it looks when you write it like it's way out there, but it isn't. Publishing wasn't even on the horizon, it sounds like. And I know I've I've done my research. I know you have a, a large family. I mean, so can you give us a sense of Christine's world at this point? What? How does it all fit together? I taught martial arts for years and women's self-defense. Well, not just women's. I mean, I taught uh, men too, but that was my world. I uh, surrounded myself with um, that uh, 20 six, 27 years of that. And I took in a lot of uh, abused children and um, which you can see in my books and uh, worked with unwed mothers and that I had a complete world there. Right. Writing was my escape. And when I took my kids to their um, gymnastics and their sports you know, I lived out in the country. I lived way out away from things. So I had to drive them and I would sit at their practices and write. That's what I did. Any Anybody with kids in sports has done exactly this. Yeah. But you know, that's, you know, I didn't own a computer. I didn't own a laptop. There, you know, there, there was no RWA. There was none of that. I didn't even know about RWA. I just wrote my stories and I did them for me. That was my escape. That was the one thing that I did for myself. And if the kids um, watched television at night, that's what I did is I, I wrote, I wasn't interested in television. We played Dungeons and Dragons and, Uh, I told stories to the kids, you know, we, that was our pastime and our fun together. So at what point did it become, how did it happen? I mean, how did you become Christine Fian author, published author? The thing was that there came a time when I became very ill and my doctor said to me, you cannot do martial arts anymore. And unfortunately, children want food. I, I <laughs> they do. convince them, <laughs> generally, especially the boys, that they did not need to eat. <laughs> and that they and the girls still wanted clothes. So I had to find a way to feed them and to keep clothes on their back and to pay the bills. And I was working a couple of jobs but you know it was minimum wage and I was like okay this is not gonna work and my girlfriend said to me send one of your books in and I said uh it doesn't work like that and (laughs) one it was kind of terrifying I didn't think I really wanted to send you know the thought of giving away one of my stories was not a good idea to me and I also told her they aren't taking anything with vampires in it. And at that point, I had been writing, you know, my, my Carpathian stories. That's so true, right? A paranormal was unsellable, we were told, right? In in the 90s. And so I guess my I have two questions. One is, was it just that you thought, I'm writing vampires and I'm not reading vampires. There are no vampires to be read. There was Anne Rice and now there is no one else. Or did somebody tell you, oh, you can't sell vampires? Yes, I was told that I, my friend, uh, a, a girlfriend of mine was writing to sell. And she went to this, um, she wanted to go to this thing in San Francisco that later I found out was an RWA. Sure. Oh, okay which I didn't know. And she didn't want to go alone. So she asked me to go with her. And I said, sure. So, and there were all these people in there. And (laughs) I was a little embarrassed because they would say things like, 
well, I've been working on my office for four months. No book. Mm -hmm. And then somebody else, I've been working on my book for 14 years. And (laughs) I've been working on my book for, I don't know how many, you know. God, this is the entire experience of RWA, honestly. (laughs) You know, and this went on and on. And then they get to me and I'm like, I don't know. I have 300 manuscripts under my bed. I you know, what do you say? You know? And the woman who was kind of running the whole thing, later she came up to me and, and she's like, you need an agent. <laughs> yeah, right. And I, at that time, was not interested in in selling. And I told her that. And I said, well, the latest thing I'm writing are she asked me what I was writing. I said, romance. And I said, but, you know, they have vampires in them. And she goes, oh, those aren't selling. Nobody's even, you can't get an editor to even look at them. This week's episode of Fate of Mates is sponsored by Goldie Thomas, author of The Rake and the Fake. Sarah, this is a historical romance, and it's a debut and the first in the Husband Material series. This is a book that's really going to appeal to all of our listeners who love Tessa Dare and Joanna Shoup. And so we have Charlotte, a seamstress, employed at London's most renowned modiste. And she is, you know, very aware of, like, the class differences between Mm -hmm. her and the people that come in and partake of her services. And she runs afoul of Nick. Nicholas, a charming but badly behaved Viscount, and his parents are insisting that he marry as soon as possible. After a made in Manhattan mix up, Nicholas's mother mistakes Charlotte for this woman who she thinks Nicholas should marry. Nice. And right, like there's just all of these shenanigans that happen. This book really deals with like big class issues head on. And so, you know, Charlotte, rather than being like enamored with the excessive wealth that she is now seeing in real life, is instead like, wait, we really need to we need to fix this. So Nicholas, Charlotte have to really figure out how they can be together, given this huge difference between them. First of all. This sounds like a terrific read. I love it when historical romances really tackle class differences. And you can read The Rake and the Fake by Goldie Thomas right now in print or ebook wherever you get your books. Thanks, as always, to Goldie Thomas for sponsoring the episode. Are the 300 manuscripts under your bed also paranormal adjacent? No. Okay. They weren't at that time. No. So how did we get to Dark Prince? Well, in at that time, I had quite a few children. My oldest son was in the Navy, and he came home to visit. I had two daughters who were pregnant, and he was helping uh, out to uh, building a little apartment for one of them. And he came home, uh, he, he was with a friend and he came home for lunch. He had a motorcycle and, uh, I made him lunch and we were laughing and talking and he went out the door and I said, did you put on sunscreen? And he said, Oh mom, you're going to be saying that to me when I'm 90. And I laughed and said, you bet I will. And he walked out the door and five minutes later, Maybe it was five minutes later, no more than that. The phone rang and my future son-in-law gets his call. He was on, uh, you know, for if there was an accident. And they, uh, his brother called him and said, you know, we've got a call. I'm coming to pick you up. And then the neighbor called me and said, I think your son uh, was hit. And I said, that's impossible. I just, but it was him. And uh, uh, he he didn't make it. And one of my daughters was, both of them were due. And there was a birthday party I'd been planning the next day for my youngest child. And a wedding I was planning. And... It's a very interesting thing when you lose a child. And this is for 
any trauma that people suffer. Life goes on all around you. It just keeps going. There's no way to stop it. You can't put the brakes on. And I had to keep planning a wedding. I had to keep two girls were giving birth. I had a very small child who expected to have a birthday and I didn't feel anything. I couldn't remember people talking to me, conversations. Um, and it lasted forever. Like it went on forever. I mean, I did everything I was supposed to do I went to my kids' schools. I participated in everything that I was supposed to do, but I didn't feel anything. And it went on for so long, and I thought, I have to find a way back. And uh, we always played Dungeons and Dragons together, and I always talked to him about vampires, you know, made up stories. And one of the things we talked about was why would a vampire, why would somebody want to give up your soul? And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, if you have no feelings, if you can't feel anything and nothing can touch you. And I honestly felt like I couldn't see in color anymore. Everything felt so dull. And I thought, I have to find a way back to the people I love. And that's when I started writing Dark Prince. And I started coming up with this idea that these men had to find that person that could make them feel again and see in color again. And that was my way back to, you know, you never get over it. There's no way to get over it. But, you know, I've spoken to many, many people who've had many losses or had much trauma and everybody has their own way of dealing with it. And that was mine. We shared something. It was Calvert's and I, we, we shared that. And my youngest son, yeah, he's not my youngest, but Brian, uh, he always played dungeon masters with, you know, dragon. Anyway, he played with us and um, we would talk a lot about it together. And eventually it really helped me. And so uh, developing that world became um, very therapeutic for me. And so that's how that world came about. And it's surprising when people read it, some people have that, it has that same effect on them. They get that same, um, they feel that same way. Which I find interesting that some, some people get it, this, that have suffered a loss, where other people have no idea, you know. Yeah, but I imagine when a book comes like that and from such a place, it's impossible to imagine, you know, first of all, it's it's all packed in there because when you write, that's how it goes, right? Whatever you're living is in there. Um, but also I'm I'm so I'm so moved by this story because the Carpathians are that series is never ending, right? It's 38 books now. Right. And so do you feel like you're going back every time you go back to them that you're going back to a similar place a sort of you're mining that that same that same um, love that same world sure you know you um it's funny how grief will hit you at times you know where you just um uh it comes out of nowhere I mean, it's been a long time for my son. I've lost a granddaughter. I've lost a grandson. And all of that is, you know, very um, uh, difficult. 
you know, you, you try very hard to, uh, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, keep going as the world keeps going, but anybody who's lost, uh, you know, parents, anybody, uh, you, at times it just suddenly comes out of nowhere it, and you don't know when it's going to happen. But when I write, I can, um, I can feel that connection, especially in the Carpathian world with Calvert. It makes me feel very close to him again. And so, and also there's so many issues in those books, you know, women's issues, um, miscarriages um, that women have. And I, you know, over the years with so many different friends and so many different uh, young women that have had terrible things happen to them that I've dealt with through martial arts or through other things, I've been able to talk about those things and then had women be able to read about them. And then that helps them in their lives, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's been, I've been grateful to be able to have that opportunity when I no longer can do hands-on help. So it's interesting to me too, how, I mean, I'm a big, probably one of my favorite of your series is Torpedo Inc. And those are characters that are really steeped in like trauma and, I mean, that's another thing that, like, sort of ties your your books together, right? Like, people experience terrible loss or grief or trauma, and then this connection is, like, how do they survive? Especially, like, can they, through this, like, access almost, like, parts of themselves they didn't know they, that existed, right? So when you talk about readers contacting you, is this something that, um, like they write you letters, you get emails. I mean, how do reader? How do you connect with readers who are also kind of experiencing um, this world, like this, like the emotional kind of your worlds are kind of terrible worlds, but people find each other in them, right? So, how do your readers come to you? Well, okay, Torpedo Inc. is actually my most difficult uh, series to write. I, um, when I took in children, I found that boys were treated way differently than girls. When they're molested, um, they oftentimes are not given counseling. Sometimes they're rejected from their family. The fathers don't want them. And they often are like, uh, oh, you know, especially if they're a little bit older, it's like, oh, hey, you should be happy, you know, instead of it's traumatizing for them, but nobody wants to even talk about it with a boy. And so I promised myself that someday I was going to address that issue. And I didn't honestly realize when I started looking at files, what I was really getting myself into, because you have to talk with professionals and you're looking at some file and you're reading this horrible thing that you don't even want to look at anymore. And then you talk to a professional and you say, all right, this happened to them. What's going to happen to them as an adult? And he's like, oh, he's not going to be normal. His sexual life is not going to be normal. So now you're going to have to write about this and try to find a happy ending for him because to me that's i i want to make whoever's had anything close to that experience feel hope that's what you're trying to do is say there's hope for you don't give up and most of the time i get letters there's been a few times when somebody has come personally to me um, when I'm at a convention or something, they've asked to meet with me and, and I've talked to them. Most of the time it's a letter and 
99% of the time, and it will start out, please continue to read this, but I was going to kill myself. And then I read this book. And oftentimes, especially Torpedo Inc., I think I can't write another one of these. I just can't do it. And then I don't know why I get a letter like that. And I think, oh, my God, Christine, now you're going to have to write. <laughs> Keep doing and it. Now yeah. you're going to have to write another one. <laughs> and it's interesting because not everyone gets that those books are about trauma. They don't see it. You know, they don't. And that's always interesting to me that not everyone gets what the book is actually about. I try to put on there, you know, to be careful about reading it. There's triggers for people, but um, people sometimes just don't see that, you know. One of the things that I, I keep coming back to as you're talking is Jen and I talk a lot on the podcast about how we bemoan the sort of um, the the way paranormal has faded over the last you know decade, and um, one of the reasons why is because it feels like there seems to be so much more anger and and confusion and frustration and you know all the things that are happening in the world right now. Um, paranormal, in so many ways makes us look at at those traumatic or those you know dangerous or angry or wicked things and and face them right you said you know this is about hope and we always talk about romance as the literature of hope like that is the promise so i wonder if you could talk a little bit about you know as somebody who we really do think is without you paranormal would not be here in the way that it is. How does paranormal, how did coming to paranormal and writing paranormal and, um, you know, building the subgenre happen during that time? I mean, obviously you told the remarkable story about how the Carpathians came to be, but you've never gone away. You've never left that paranormal world. Even when you do leave it, it always, there's always a vibe, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, because for me, I know that other people don't really believe in so much in all those things, but I think the world is so big and there's so many interesting unsolved mysteries in it. And I'm, I can't stop doing research. I'm like the research nut. And I find everything so fascinating. And I don't necessarily, I know we use the word paranormal, but I always think there's so much out there. And so to me, I just think maybe it's really all true and we haven't caught up with it yet. So to me, it's just extending my imagination and then trying to um, find reality in it. And I try to put the book at least 80% facts. I mean, twisting those facts into my fiction, fictional world, and then just a small amount of the paranormal so that um, when people read it, they're like, oh, this could happen. This could be. When I did um, Lightning Game, most of that was reality. I mean, it it's amazing what they're doing with lightning. And you look at it and go, holy moly. <laughs> you know. So could you talk a little bit about that paranormal? I mean, we're, I'm using paranormal now, respecting what you, what you just said, but a, a paranormal as a subgenre, right, um, of romance. When we, during that sort of that boom where it just felt, I mean, it just felt like everyone was writing these kind of big, expansive worlds with these heroes who were just larger than life and these heroines who just could match them, you know, step for step. What was going on there? Do you, are you able to look back on that time and go, oh, this is why we were all 
doing this this thing together or this was why readers were really drawn to us you know i i don't i think that um in t- different times call for different things you know people are um at times they need certain things in their lives you know they and and they're looking for heroes and they're looking for things that make them happy um unfortunately i don't honestly know what's happening right now where everybody seems so angry and <laughs> weird with each other like it's so strange to me i don't understand that but i'm getting kind of old so <laughs> you know but um it i i think everybody's imagination was really big and everybody at that time really accepted it and and they went all out and they were and readers were like hey what do you have for me i'm yeah. I'm, willing, I'm willing to read it you know and they they went for it so i think that was a really good time at, you know and people were in a good place and as things started to crumble, the economy and whatever, you know, then I think that things sort of went downhill. And also, when you get too many people doing the same thing, it runs out. You know, you can only do so many of the same types and then it gets, uh, you're, there's a lot of repetition, and maybe towards the end there, there might have been. I don't, I don't know. So, were there other writers who you were friendly with, who you, who you were in your group, were you know inspiring you during that time? Um, not in my group. I had a very poor group, but um, I will tell you, I read uh, Mary Janice Davidson. And she made me laugh so hard. I am not the best at writing humor. When I read her, I would laugh so hard. And I would just about die. She made me laugh so much. There were certain ones that, you know, you'd pick them up. And to be honest, I didn't read much in my own genre because I didn't want to step on somebody's voice or, you know, but uh, I couldn't help it with her. Every time she had a book come out, I'd go get it because she just was so funny. But I don't, like I say, I don't write very humorously. And I try, but my <laughs> falls flat. <laughs> so did you join RWA? You mentioned like sort of not knowing what it was. Was I that joined, something that... I had to um, at one point because... My house, I was with Dorchester at the time when I first, they were the only ones who would read my book and then they bought it. Who was your editor there? Alicia Condon. Alicia Condon. Okay. And she was wonderful. Like she just, she and was. And she great. acquired you. She at did. Yes. Okay. And, you know, people always said things about Dorchester, but they gave new authors a chance when nobody else would. And took such risk in terms of yes. the content of the books. I mean, I was yes. saying to Jen before we started that one of my very favorite, his- I write historicals, and one of my very favorite historicals is The Madness of Lord Ian Mackenzie, which, you know, the hero, it, it's it's such an, it's such a different kind of historical. And I just can't, I think it benefited from Dorchester. I think that uh, they did a really good job at getting people seen when nobody else would even look at them, you know, not one other house would have, well, they wouldn't. Sure. Vampires, right? Right. They wouldn't look at it. And she did, and she picked it up. So that was, that was pretty amazing of her to do that. So, And then you were with Dorchester until Dorchester folded. I was already being looked at by Berkeley, Cindy, Cindy Mm -hmm. Wong had already uh, made an offer for me and, um, and I've been with her ever since she's been my editor for years and years and years. 
So, yeah, I I was already with Berkeley at that point, but they had a bunch of my books. Right. Um, still. Because you're such a fast writer. Now, were you build Now, how was that working? Were you pulling things out things out from under the bed or no, no. It, the bed manuscripts no, no, the are bed still, still under still the bed. Have, no, cuz <laughs> ones under the bed were not polished and they weren't that good. <laughs> I don't believe it, but okay. <laughs> no, they were not that good. <laughs> so because you're so prolific as well, you know, what is it? A, almost 100 books. Is that right? Yes. Very close to 100 books. And mm-hmm. so you are really, I mean, you are still writing really quickly. You're you're writing at, you know, a self-published Whoopsie. pace. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually am slowing down a little bit so I can... Um, Go visit occasionally. Go see my mom and not my mom, my sisters occasionally. I have a lot of sisters. And is that, do you feel like I? you have a big thing? You have a huge, a, a large number of children, a lot of sisters. Do you feel like that those kinds of relationships are part of why you have been drawn so much to packs? I mean, <laughs> you know, commu- big <laughs> communities of characters. Yeah, I've always loved being in a big family. This week's episode of Faded Mates is sponsored by Lumi Labs, creators of microdose gummies. So, Lumi Labs, our old friends, you've heard us talk about microdosing and the concept of microdosing before on the podcast. Uh, It's commonly associated with psychedelics, with wellness, performance enhancement, and creativity. If you're looking to consider microdosing, you can do a quick Google search or you can go to microdose.com and learn more about how taking a microdose gummy might help you just with a little bit of mood enhancement with maybe helping you sleep, which is what they do for me. For me too. Pain, anxiety. Um, Eric takes them for creativity and kind of a general kind of joyfulness across the day. He said to me the other day, you know what the thing is about these gummies? You take one and you just like an hour and a half later just feel like, I feel... Like, I'm in a good mood. Yes. And listen, we all need that these days. <laughs> if they didn't put me to sleep, they would definitely help me feel like I was in a good mood. Anyway, microdosing is available nationwide. And uh, these we have all tried these gummies. And we think you might enjoy them, too, if there's something you're interested in. So you can check out, uh, go to microdose.com and use the code FADEDMATES to get 30% on your first order. Um, they have all different kinds of flavors you can try. I'm a particular fan of cotton candy lately. I also like one that's like uh, orange flavored. So you should try, uh, check it out, give it a try. And um, thanks as always to Lumi Labs for sponsoring this week's episode. Another interesting like hallmark of your career is that you have several, I mean, very long running series that you're essentially writing concurrently, right? And so this is unusual. A lot of people will like start and finish a series and you have like a bunch that just are kind of continuing. So how is, what's your process for like kind of deciding what's next, keeping it all straight? You know, like that seems like a, a huge job. You know, it's very strange. My my brain, <laughs> how it works. Um, a character will come to me and say, I want my story told. <laughs> and I can't write, like I couldn't write two Carpathian stories in a row because I'd be bored mm. with that world. So I write that story And then while I'm writing that story, all of a sudden, another character from another world will jump into my head and start pushing at me. And I have to tell it to be quiet. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not your turn yet. Wait till I'm finished. And then, you know, then that one will, you know. Well, a lot of times now, because I'll have a contract and they'll want the stories in a certain order. Order, right. And so I had to train my brain to say, it's going to be like this. And if they mess up the order on me, it, it's actually difficult now. Yeah, I would imagine. Because my brain would be like, we have to do it this way. 
Mm-hmm. I'm not going to get the titles right, but like the head of Torpedo Inc. was the, you know, the husband of the end of the series with all the sisters. Right, yeah. Mm-hmm. So did that, like when, you know, kind of characters intersect in that way, is that like a surprise to you? Because I wasn't planning on publishing Torpedo Inc. I wasn't going to. And when I had that in there, Cindy said to me, uh, do you have these other characters? This guy. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, but I don't think they're something that, you know, I could publish because it's a pretty raw, edgy series. And she said, well, let me read it. And that's kind of how that ended up getting published. We've had several people on who are edited by Cindy and it sounds like she is one of those editors who is willing to just, again, take the risk with you and trust she, you to move she forward. She will take a risk. Yeah, she will. That's she's not, amazing. She's pretty fearless and, and she's not, she's not afraid. She'll be, and she's not, if I went to her and said, I want to, I'd like to publish this and it's like out there, she would say, go ahead and write it. Let's take a look at it. Mm-hmm. Have there been other editors, publishers, I don't know, art directors? Oh, wait, can we talk about those early covers, first of all? Oh, yeah. So I'm so fascinated. Listen, I could talk about romance novel covers all day, every day. In fact, I, Jen will tell you I, I kind of do. Um, but those early covers, so that, that first cover of Dark Prince is a clinch. It's like a historical clinch, presumably because no one knew what the heck to do with these books, right? Right. And then can you walk us through, Do you are you able to sort of th- remember or recall how Paranormal became, like how it started to look the way it did, why we moved away from those clinches? Well, the, there were funny, funny things that happened with some of them. The I love it. When- uh, it was Jacques' book, and he, they put him on the cover, and I said, well, uh, this cover is fine, except that he he had, or she had, red hair. It was a clinch cover. Mm-hmm. So they washed the cover red. Oh, so my gosh. The he, whole cover. The whole yeah. cover. So he is like sunburned. Like I called him Lobster Boy after what that. What book Every, is this? It was Dark Dark Desire. I'm looking it up right now. <laughs> yeah. So he literally has like he's red. And so you think I, I know what this is. I I did. I called him Lobster Boy. So every time anybody would would refer to him, I would think in my head, I'd turn it around. And he'd be Lobster Boy. Oh no. <laughs> My girlfriend, one of my friends, she just loved him. She called him Pookie Face. Mm-hmm. Oh, she'd be like, Don't he you really, call he's my orange. Yeah. yeah. Yes. He yeah. is. I'm looking at, totally. we'll put it, everybody look down at we'll your podcast it, yeah. right now. We'll show it to you. Yeah. He's yes. orange. Yeah. Uh-huh. How funny. Yeah. And he, here's the other thing that happened with that book. This is, this is just like a little, so it starts off with, there was blood, an ocean of it, a river of it running or something. The first sentence. And I had worked on that first chapter a million ways. And he's insane. I mean, when he comes awake, he's he's totally insane. And if you don't know what happened to him, you would hate that guy because he's an <laughs> ass, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you have to start out with him and knowing what happened to him. And I I think I wrote that first chapter 40 different ways. Well, when they got the book, they're like, we have to change this first chapter because they have to know that it's a romance and you can't start out this way. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm not changing it. How funny. <laughs> I go, toss, toss the book. We're not tossing the book. (laughs) Amazing. No, but, and then what, listen, when we first got on with you and you said, well, I don't know. Am I a trailblazer? Christine. (laughs) Christine. Here's why. (laughs) 
this is how paranormals begin now with the heroes yes. in trauma. And yes. then you just sort of ride the wave until you get to the kissing parts. Well, I finally just said, you know, that clinch cover, they're going to know it's a romance. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. Exactly. I think they'll know. Yeah. So at what point did it feel that, I mean, this is obviously a market thing, right? This is not a, this is like, you know, how the sausage is made a little But When do the clinches, when does everybody realize, oh, paranormals need a different look? Is that just because it started to become so the market just you know I more really exciting? Think when I moved over to Berkeley, I think that the uh the marketing people at Berkeley kind of uh figured that out. It, yeah, they were the ones for me, for my team, they were the ones who kind of um said, okay, we're gonna do this differently. Interesting enough, uh in Germany, my books, all of them. Even the like the ghost walkers, all of them have bats on the cover. Oh. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> it's a can of soup, right? I know. I'm I mean, like, <laughs> does Sophian like mean bat in German? I don't know. Maybe. That's funny. Who knows? Yeah. They do very well, but yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, well, if it ain't broke, right? Mm-hmm. I look, I you can tell I really love your books. Um but one of the things Sarah and I have talked about a lot is like, you know, romance, it, romance comes and goes, right? Like the the way that what's popular as a trope, what kind of subgenres are popular, right? What kinds of hero archetypes are popular? Like these things change over time. And right now, right, like kind of the romance hero has changed a lot. But I don't necessarily think that your romance heroes has cha- have changed a lot. So how do you like i don't know like do you feel the push of like market forces or it doesn't matter your readers are you know you know i don't i don't look at trends and i don't look at that kind of thing at all i have to go with whatever i'm passionate about and i have to go with whatever character is in my head and i just hope my readers love the story and love the the characters. I write the best book that I can. I try every single book to improve and give a better story. And sometimes I succeed. I I do my best. But um, there is no way that I uh, can write a story to the market. It's not going to happen. And I know that. So I don't even try. Well, what's amazing is you really you've made a career out of arguably not writing to market right you you wrote vampires before vampires were cool you you know you moved to shifters before everyone else moved to shifters and it's it's amazing your your ins- the inspiration that you give writers is you know write your truth well the the series that i'm doing i got I, I know it's a bad thing to call it the murder series I really should not for me. And I think that that might be more to market than we'd like to admit, honestly. Well, I got into that one because um, my one of my daughters uh, does a lot of climbing. She used to live in Bishop, which is you know up in the Mammoth area near Yosemite, and she knew knows these women, and all of them have these incredible stories. And they all became friends and they would go climbing together. And I would listen to their stories of, how, you know, where they came from. And then they have these insane jobs. And I was thinking, wow, this is amazing. And one day they were telling me about this hike they'd gone on. And I thought, what a perfect place for a serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> and so then... I'm like, okay, they were all going to go on on a hike together and camping. And I said, okay, girls, I really want you to start looking around for a place where a serial <laughs> killer might be like hanging out, yeah. ready to report It's back. totally yeah. fine. <laughs> so after that, I started having the girls every time they go someplace do that for me. And 
the next thing I know, they're taking tasers with them. I was going to say, they stop hiking. They're done with that now. <laughs> kind of ruined it. For them, you know? We're talking murder every time we go to the <laughs> restaurants. <laughs> So um, one of the questions that we often ask is, uh, what what's the hallmark of a Christine Fian romance? When they, when a reader picks up a Christine Fian novel, one of your nearly one hundred of them, yeah. um, what if, what do they know they're going to get? Well, for sure, they're going to get a happy ending. Absolutely sure, they're going to get the ending. Um, I I write always about. I think hope and about um, finding your own version of family. Um, It doesn't matter what the setting is or what the um, trauma that has been it's about or what uh, I want to say genre, but of course it's romance but it could be military, it could be suspense, it could be anything. But set in that, there has to be that hope and the finding of family um, and that happy ending. That's what you're going to get. That's what you're going to find. And we didn't talk about this, but it's also going to be super sexy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I feel like we should sort of touch on this because I do feel like for me those early fians were and the late ones don't no no no, no. <laughs> i mean for me though sarah like when i stumbled upon christine fian in the bookstore there it it felt like i'd never read anything like this before and i wonder can you talk a little bit about that about um you know, bring, really like bringing bringing sex to a to the genre in a lot of ways. It I feel like there was a not that it didn't exist before, but there's there's something about the Fian sensuality that is different. Well, uh, to me, the characters are really real. Mm-hmm. I people have asked me that before. I'm not in the book at all. When I'm writing that book, it really is the characters. I don't plot out the book so the characters are so real to me that i i know everything about them from the time they were little and so when they're moving through that story it's all about them and they're the ones that are having sex or not having sex or whatever's having happening to them and so i i'm not somebody who will ever cut and paste a love scene you're not going to get the same one because they're two they're always it's a different couple Mm -hmm. and so they react differently to each other and to whatever situation is going on and um i step back so far when i'm writing that i'm not there and it's really it's almost plays out like like it's reality for them yeah and um, so to me, it's just part of life. I don't, I don't get embarrassed. I don't get, you know, it's, it's just part of life. And I put that in and part of the reason for that, and I know this is going to sound crazy, but so many girls that had had these terrible things happen to them would be very promiscuous, but they never felt anything. And I, I would say it's because you don't have a good partner. You're not in love with your partner. You don't, he's not, he's not doing anything for you. So I wanted them to know what good sex was. And if you have a book that you can read when no one's around and you can see what good sex is, then it's when you have a partner and I can tell you, this is another thing. I get lots of letters. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I and believe I, that I even had letters from guys who told me they would not cheat on their wives because military guys, because they realized that their wife 
was too important to them. And I mean, it's, it's amazing. And writers should realize that the words they put down touch people. And you don't know who they're, you're going to touch and you don't know uh, what you say is going to do, what it's going to do to somebody. I mean, when I write something, I don't, I don't know who it's going to affect, but I deliberately did put sex in my books for that reason, because I wanted people to know this is, there is good sex. Yeah. Should know that there is, and you should feel something. And I love the, I love the way you talk about it as you're so distant from the book itself. You're you're just writing the book, and it's and I think that's really what a fian, that's why it feels so different as a reader. Or it did, you know, in those in those early books, they felt transcendent because you they did feel intense and passionate in that way, that sort of private way. Yeah. Now, when I started the leopard series that was kind of my nod to erotica yeah um erotic wasn't a huge huge thing then you know now it kind of is but it wasn't at the time and so i was like okay i'm gonna um i'm gonna just do a little bit of that and that was before tor- torpedo ink and so i thought oh, i'll put that in my leopard one because it made sense to go there but then I started writing Torpedo Ink, and I'm like, uh oh, now I've got yeah. two. That's it's hot, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with it. No, the Leopard series. I mean, it blew. I remember coming to the Leopard series and just feeling like nobody had ever done anything like that before. So, yeah. So I, I think the question we love to end with is. Um, I mean, so it's kind of like a two part question, I guess. Like one is like, is there a book that you hear about over and over again from readers? And then sort of the question we have for you is, is there a book of yours that's your favorite, the one that you are most proud of? Well, the one I hear about all the time from readers is Dark Celebration. Mm -hmm. Every single person wants me to write that book over and over and over and over. (laughs) They can just reread it. They can reread it every reread it everybody. It slaps every time. It's so funny. And why do you think that is? I think because it revisits characters they love. Yes. Mm-hmm. I think that's it's it. reader care and feeding, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that that's it. Um, what book would I be the most proud of, or the one that's most special to you? That- People take it in different ways. Probably the one that's the most special to me is Dark Prince, for obvious reasons. Yeah. yeah. Right. That would probably be the one I would say. Well, thank you for being with us This today. was incredible. Was. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. And I'm. it's really an honor. I really enjoyed being with you. Thank you for inviting me. Every single one of these goes differently. Yeah. It's amazing. I think the thing I liked about our conversation with Christine is how personal it felt. I mean, obviously, not just the short, the stories that she shared, but just you can really feel how um, reading and writing and thinking about hope and happily ever afters is really something she spent her entire life on. And there's a a way that I think that just really came through in that conversation. It was so fascinating. Absolutely. It felt, you know, she talked a few times about how readers have approached her and talked to her about how special her books are to them and how moving they are and how inspirational and, and important they are to readers. And every time she told them, I got, I had the same thought, which was, I think it, it must be really wonderful to have a conversation personal conversation with Christine Fian. She feels like she's present in the moment. Yeah. The whole time. And it was really special. I get very distracted by people. You know, I feel like even in my classroom, I'm kind of constantly doing 800 things at once. But you really feel that 
she probably has such a great mom and a grandma. You know what I oh mean? Like gosh. the attention that she really gives and the way that she talks about um I, I, I'm fascinated, too, by people who say, like, I am a writer. I've always been a writer. I love writing. There's 300 books under the bed. A compulsive writer. I love that. This sort of I would have written with or without publishing. I loved that story about how she got dragged up to an RWA meeting and everybody was like, well, I've been working on the same <laughs> thing for a while. And she's like, I have 300 books, but I never intended to do this. I also think that that goes hand in hand then with like not really worrying about, you know, quote unquote, the market, right? So when you are writing in that way and you've had success writing in that way and you've had readers respond to you in that way, then I think it's really powerful to see someone stay the course. I feel like if you are out there right now and you are looking at a manuscript and you think it won't sell you th- because of the market. Hearing Christine talk is just must be so important and inspirational for you um, because we've talked a lot about we talked to people like Jane Ann Krentz. I loved that she mentioned Jane. Um, we've talked about Jane. You know, when we talked to Jane, when we talked to J.R. Ward, we've heard the story of people who change genres because, you know, as J.R. Ward puts it, they were fired, right? Or, you know, the, it just wasn't selling, so they pivoted. And we've talked so much about how writers have to be nimble to thrive in the genre. And I think what's fascinating is that Christine is nimble and she is full of ideas and shifting, you know, and changing, but she stays really true to her brand and to her her point of view. And I think that's a really valuable thing to hold on to right now, especially um, as we see romance really grappling with those big questions about what comes next and have we oversaturated and these kind of big, you know, issues. We didn't have a chance to ask her. She has like re-released some of her romances. Um, oh, we meant to. I ask. know as like we sort of distracted. authors cuts, right? Um, is with the rise of self-publishing, I think there is a way in which there's a you know there's always a market for for something, right? There's always a small dedicated group of readers who are looking for whatever it is you're selling. It's traditional publishing that has, you know, that it can't quite have that leeway to just be like, yes. And so it's really interesting to hear her talk about that Dorchester imprint taking a chance on her and and what the, the difference that made. And, you know, it's funny because that is not a name. I mean, Dorchester, I feel like, is not a name I've even ever heard spoken about before in romance. I mean, it's really fascinating because I hadn't thought of Dorchester until we were prepping. I was doing research. We were prepping for this episode. You guys, these are the only episodes we actually prep for. We do actually do research before we talk to these people <laughs> because we're trying to, you know, get them to think we're intelligent. And so <laughs> then we know what we're doing. So, um, but no, I mean, Dorchester... I, and now, of course, I want to go back and lo- and look a little more at Dorchester. But it was I I was thinking about our conversation with Radcliffe when we were talking about you know how these small presses were really the places where big um, adventures were happening in romance. And obviously, for Radcliffe, it and for E.E. E. Ottoman, these things were, that was a different kind of thing, right? Like that was happening because queer presses had to publish queer books because traditional publishers weren't doing that. But paranormal, you know, I think about those those digital only presses, again, those kind of Alora's Cave and Sam Hain and those places that were taking big risks. And so it doesn't surprise me that like one of the mothers of paranormal. Yeah. Came up through a place that doesn't exist anymore. This is something I don't, uh, you know, I don't know that I've ever heard any author explicitly state as clearly, which is when you write from a place, right? When she told that, I mean, heartbreaking story of her son's death, right? That that somehow there are some readers who can like plug into that. 
and see, right? Like see kind of a, I don't know, see themselves in that too. And I think that's one of the things, you know, we talk so much about romance being about the genre of hope, about feelings, right? Romance is about feelings, but it's our feelings as readers too. Yep. Right? And I think that this is something that I was really impressed at how clear-eyed it felt like she was about about that relationship, right? Like, if I'm writing from this place, it's going to find the readers in that place. And I also think there is – talk about a fearlessness in terms of character and, you know, theme, because – she really does write about trauma. And, you know, maybe we'll put in the show notes a link to the discussion that Jen and Adriana Herrera have had about writing trauma and how, you know, romance and trauma kind of do go hand in hand a lot. But there is – it's interesting because I think writing trauma is a thing that we are talking about a lot in the industry without talking about it, really having conversations about – how you put these things on the page so that characters and writers and readers are can see it raw in a raw way. I think she even used that word like raw. And these books are not for the faint of heart. They are they are rough reads. And she is writing into that space in a way that I think a lot of us are afraid to do. And I think it's because she clearly has seen it. She's faced it. And that's really, I I loved every minute of that conversation. Romance gives me so much. But when I kind of interact with someone who has the same root causes, and I've, and I've talked about this before, like I started reading romance after my parents got divorced. The pain of that was the only thing that made me feel like hope and better was like was reading romance like that there are people out here who have also gone through painful things and they find a way to love each other and so it really is interesting I think for me when you talk to someone who I don't know like right like that talk about the branches of the romance tree it feels like we were planted in the same ground yeah yeah gosh it was very, that was a very cool conversation. I mean, I should have expected it to be, but. A lot of our trailblazers were really pushing for like, tell us the story of publishing, tell us your story through that journey. And that's not what her story was about. And I loved, I loved hearing it. It was amazing. I'm so inspired every time. <laughs>